We're just waiting for the speaker to finish some of the one-on-one -on -one consultations that she had. So Katie will be here shortly, or Kate, sorry, Kate. All right, please, Says on, she's on her way, so uh, please be patient. She was finishing up some consultations. Um, so I guess it gives us an opportunity just for a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I know all of you guys have downloaded the conference app. You all have it on your phone. Um, that's where you'll find the um, survey to uh, the, um, evaluate the sessions and the conference as a whole. So if you go on there at the end of this session and uh, just let us know what you thought, your input is valuable in planning 2020 and beyond. So we'd really appreciate it if you do both of those things. Um, you don't have to do it right today because we all want to take a couple days off when this is done. Um, but do it as soon as you can so that we have that information. Um, Jam-packed uh, afternoon of sessions as well. Then, of course, uh, um, one of the highlights, I'm going to say one of the highlights, not the only highlight, but one of the highlights is our closing session from 4.30 to 5.30. Um, we'll have some door prizes there that's followed by the group photo. If you have your fail and lucky gear, wear that for the group photo, so wear it to the closing session. You don't have to have fail and lucky gear. It's not required to be in the photo. We want to have everybody in there, so if you didn't bring anything, that'd be great. Um, I mean, sorry, you can still get in the picture. And then we'll have a little bit of a break, and then from 6.30 to 8.30, um, we have our traditional wiffle ball, which will be in Heritage 6 through 8. Um, this is something that we that just kind of sprung up um, after our first conference, and it's just a fun time for all the kids to play some baseball and run the bases, and siblings are welcome as well, and um, it's just fun to see all the kids uh, uh, participate in some baseball and have some fun, and it's just kind of a way to unwind at the end of a hectic weekend. So. 
um, be sure to be here for that. We're not doing it outside, so it's not going to be too hot. To <laughs> We're doing it indoors. This will be the first time indoors, so you'll, you can participate in, in a first-time event there, too. So. But we we'll, should be able to get started here shortly. And I guess, too, since she's coming from one-on-one -on -one consultations, um, there are one-on-one -on -one consultations throughout the day still for communications and genetics and toileting. So if you have a, you know, a spot and you want to have some questions about those issues, uh, most of those are in the boardrooms that are kind of back in the corner there as you head over to the Bass Pro Shop. So you can go there and see if there's still spots available on sign-up sheets and uh, um, uh, get on those sign-up sheets so you can get your questions answered on a one-on-one. -on -one. All right, so I think we're uh, pretty much ready to go. We got our technical issues taken care of and our speaker is here. This is Kate Ahern. Um, Kate, she's an uh, intensive special needs teacher certified for ages birth through adult in Massachusetts and an assistive technology specialist. She spent 20 years working with children and young adults who have complex communication needs She's also the author of a popular special education blog and moderates several social media groups about augmentative and alternative communication. So welcome, Kate, and it's all, all yours. Hi, everyone. How are you all today? Good. Been a good conference so far. It's your last day, right? I just got here yesterday, nice and warm. As we were landing, the pilot was like, and it's 113 degrees in Dallas today. Okay. <laughs> I don't like it when it's hot at home, and the best we ever do is like 101. And that only lasts for like an hour. <laughs> so we're going to talk today about augmentative and alternative communication. Um, I have a lot of experience in AAC, which is what we call it for populations of kids who have apraxia, which is a message passing problem. Apraxia is when the message doesn't go from the brain to the body properly, and the motor movements aren't coordinated. Apraxia is the reason most kids with feline McDermott, um, feline McDermott and Rett syndrome and Angelman syndrome, and a large population of kids with autism are unable to speak. And the catch is that a lot of these kids also have some significant anxiety. Have any of you seen anxiety in your, your kids? And anxiety, of course, makes the communication worse, right? So the minute you increase anxiety, we see the communication ability go down, which is, of course, the exact moment when we really need to be able to communicate. Um, and somehow that became what I do. I work with kids who have problems with apraxia, and that is combined with problems with anxiety. So that's um, how I ended up sort of in a bit of a niche in the AAC communication world. So we're gonna talk about the basics, about augmentative communication, and then we're gonna talk about how do you do this at home. So in this room, how many of you are parents? Everybody, grandparents, a few, any professionals in the room? <laughs> I got one person who's like, I don't want to admit it. <laughs> professionals in this field. All right, so it's an all parent audience. That's my favorite kind. Don't tell the professionals I said that. My favorite kind of audience. So let's talk about some underlying assumptions that we all need to agree on um, as we go into talking about communication. The first principle is everybody communicates. So even kids who are unable to speak and adults who are unable to speak 
still communicate with us, right? They still make their needs known to a degree. They're able to make their point when they really, really want to make their point, right? So that might be pointing or grabbing or sounds or refusals. Even kids who have very little control over their bodies find a way to make their point when they want to. So I have kids who can only move their eyes on my caseload. And you know what they do when they don't like what I have planned for a session? They shut their eyes, right? <laughs> That's the perfect out. Now you can't do anything with me. All I can move is my eyes and I have them shut. So <laughs> everybody communicates, absolutely everyone. So let's think about all the different ways that people communicate. So most of us in this room are verbal and we communicate through spoken language, but that's not the only way we communicate. All of you are communicating different messages to me right now. A lot of you are actually the most attentive bunch I've seen in months. <laughs> you're paying attention, you're looking at the slides, you're looking at me, some of you are taking notes, and through all that you're communicating to me that this is something you're interested in, and maybe I might be doing a good job, but I haven't really been talking long enough to judge that yet. <laughs> now, some of you in the back are here with your kids, and even your kids are communicating messages, right? See? We plan that. We've never met, but we totally plan that. All right, so, and so we're all communicating these messages back and forth all the time. Other than verbal language and facial expressions and body movements and sound, we might communicate by pointing to pictures, by typing, by using a speech output device. Um, you know, through texting we communicate. I'm sure some of you are actually doing that right now, right? Um, <laughs> all these different ways that we communicate. So we have to be careful when we talk about communication to remember that everything counts, right? The way your child makes a point by bringing you an object because they want you to do something with it. They bring you the remote because they want the TV on, right? That's communication, that counts. It counts as communication. All right, so all forms of communication count. So I have a minor problem in that I don't have my glasses on and I can't see my slides. So I'm gonna assume that you can read that. <laughs> but I know that the general message is that it all counts, that all of this communication counts. But what our, our need is, we need for, uh, to work with our students and our children to teach them how to communicate in ways that are more understandable. And our job is always the fastest, most effective method of communication. So we never wanna f force a kid to do something in a way that is less effective or slower. Now sometimes you have things that are fast but not effective. Slapping you is fast not terribly effective, right? It's effective in that you probably get out of their way, but other than that, not terribly effective in getting your need met. Um, so our job is to teach a better way. What's a better way to get your need met that is faster and more effective than whatever you're using now? And that's always what we need to be thinking. Sometimes when we introduce communication to our kids, we, we wanna make them use the system we're giving them so we'll touch, use your talker to tell me that. Use your system to tell me that. No, I heard you say it verbally, now say it in sign. You've just made it slower and less effective. So we always have to remember our job is faster and more effective and to teach that. And that changes from person to person, right? Not everybody understands word approximations or sign. So at some point we have to start teaching our kids as they go, go off to school usually how to switch modes of communication, how to code switch is what we call it, to go from you know, the sounds and gestures that work at home to something that's a little more formal for, for other people. So when we think about these multimodal ways, these ways that can we're looking at, are they fast and effective? We're thinking about facial expressions, we're thinking about vocalizations, body movements, um, have any of you ever rocked with your child and you stop rocking and they sort of push on you to keep rocking? We call that co-active movement. When the child pushes on you to get you to keep rocking, 
they're communicating for continuation, right? They're saying more. So that means that they already understand that if they do something, they can change your actions, right? So we already have what we're calling communication intent, right? Wanting to communicate is already there, and that's important. Um, eye pointing, um, some kids who have less motor skills may be very good at staring at something until you figure out that that's what they want. Uh, one of my clients is a 19, she's now 20, no, she's not 21 year old young woman. She has rat syndrome. Um, and her first session, and she had no means of, no formal means of communication. Her first session ever, I had a Diet Coke and she had an iced tea. She was staring at my Diet Coke. So I showed her on her device. I said, just so you know, if you wanted to ask for Diet Coke, here's how you would say it. And I, I showed her, I want, brought her to the drink page and I showed her where Diet Coke was. A minute or two went by and she said, Diet Coke, Diet Coke, Diet Coke, Diet Coke. And that was with an eye gaze run device. So it was a device where um, there are cameras in it that tracked her eye movements. So all she had to do was look at the picture in order to activate it. And um, that was the first, her first word, if you wish, was Diet Coke, Diet Coke, Diet Coke, Diet Coke. And she, of course, got a Diet Coke. It's been a couple years since that happened now, and she now, um, we were able to go through insurance and get her her own system. Um, one of her favorite things to do now is to insist on calling me Baby Kate. She loves the show Arthur, on the cartoon show Arthur on PBS, and uh, even though she's 20 years old, she loves it. And uh, there's a character, Baby Kate, and she would rather do like nine hits on her device to get to the page that has the word Baby Kate than to just go to people, teachers, and find my name, right? Because she thinks it drives me crazy. I actually love it, don't tell her, secret. Um, so eye pointing, gestures, all of these different ways that um, people who are communicating all the time, not just people with disabilities, but all people. I really can't see my slides at all. Thank you, making it meaningful. Um, so one of the things we're gonna do when I talked about the fastest and most efficient thing we can do. Thank you so much. I can't believe I was totally winging it that long, can you? Two years ago, I had to do a keynote address, on a, and it was online, and I decided to present it from AAC Camp. So every summer, I volunteer for at a week for kids who use communication systems, high-tech communication systems. And um, <laughs> I started giving the keynote um, at camp, but it turned out that there were technical difficulties, and there were no slides. So I had to talk for an hour, just live, at camp. The parents of the campers were all in the room, and about halfway through, the campers decided they wanted to be in the room. And they all had their little faces pressed on the glass. And they kept going to their devices and be like, come in. And I was, you know, trying to keep going. It was, I was really happy when they didn't break down the door. Um, so we are going to honor all communication attempts that are meaningful and understandable. So we're never going to say to a kid who manages to tell us that they want milk, okay, you want milk, now tell me again with your talker, right? That's a good way to make a kid hate their talker. And we do not want that, because the minute they hate their talker, our job just got so much harder to teach them how to communicate. Instead, what we can do is, if they make it clear that they want milk, if they sign milk, or they point to the milk, or they bring you the milk, you can take their talker and say, you're telling me I want milk. So they at least see how the message is made with the talker without sort of putting them in that position to hate their talker. Um, and we're gonna use multimodal communication ourselves. You wanna use all the different modes that your child uses to communicate. If they're signing and talking and using a speech device, then you wanna be signing and talking and using a speech device. And I'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. So why do we communicate? Or apparently, hi do we communicate is what it's become. So the first, 
the first reason we communicate is, um, and so this, I'm, I'm telling you this um, based on the research of Janice Light, who's very big in the field of augmentative communication. Um, so in the field of AAC and speech pathology, these are the functions of communication. There are other fields who have developed their own functions. I'm talking about my field. Um, so in the field of AAC, Janice Light <coughs> did a lot of research and she discovered the first thing that we communicate is wants and needs. Um, so I want a drink, I want to go outside, I want to go to the playground, all of those sorts of messages. The next reason that we communicate is to transfer information. You know, um, oh, Kate, you're at the wrong door. The room you're presenting in is on the other side of the hotel, right? Transferring information. Um, or if you're staying at the Homewood Suites, we're really sorry about all this construction. Um, don't worry, we'll stop working. Uh, no, we won't. We'll keep working right outside your door. <laughs> um, for social closeness, and those are the things we say to each other to, to establish a bond. And really, that's the main, as we get older, um, our wants and needs that we communicate decrease because a lot of times we can, you know, we can get our own drink and take ourselves to the park. Um, but social closeness is always a huge need. And the final um, reason that Janice Light found was social etiquette. So those are our pleases and our thank yous and the things we say because they're polite to say them. And then Buchanan and Miranda, who are more big names in this field, looked at internal dialogue, and that's how do we use language within our own heads, right? So we're all having conversations with ourselves all the time. So this morning I got up, oh, I tried to upload my presentation again because it didn't work last night, um, and then I got a text saying, don't forget, you need to be here by 10. I went to get the shuttle, and the hotel desk worker said to me, oh, um, the shuttle was going to be late, 15 minutes, so that's when I started negotiating with myself, right? Okay, so if they're going to be 15 minutes late, my options are I could get a lift, I could wait, I could check and see if they're really... So all of these conversations we have with ourselves all the time, it's very difficult to have those conversations with yourself if you don't have language in your head, right? So one of the things that we find is for some AAC users, when we teach them to use a device, we're teaching them how to take the words in their head and communicate them to the world. For other AAC users, we have to teach them to communicate in their head first. So we're teaching them how to use a device at the same time as we're teaching them how to interact with themselves in their heads. And this internal dialogue is incredibly important if you want to be able to stay calm when you're upset. Now, I'm sure we all have dialogues we have with ourselves when we start to get upset, right? So, say, okay, uh, uh, relax, I'm going to count to 10, I'm going to take a deep breath. You know, all of these conversations that, that we, we have all the time with ourselves. If our kids don't have access to internal dialogue, they can't have these conversations with, ourselves, with themselves. Right, so they can't think to themselves, mom's telling me I can have a YouTube video in 10 minutes. I can wait 10 minutes, that's not that long. That's only a third of a Sesame Street. I can do that. If they don't have access to the language in their head, they can't do that. So all they're seeing is nope. Nope, not happening. There's a thing, I want it, I can't have it. And that's it. So part of what we need to do with language is teach kids how to use it to, for their own good within their own heads. And there are some things that we can do with their systems to help with that. We can give them messages where they're talking to, their, to themselves. I can wait. I can have safe hands. I'm okay. Um, social closeness, social etiquette, <laughs> and internal dialogue. So our goal is, wow, my slides did not transfer well. Um, <laughs> so our goal is for our kids to be able to do all of these things. And sometimes we get very stuck on wants and needs. But we don't actually that's not the primary reason that we all communicate for the most part. Mostly we communicate for social closeness. So wants and needs are important, but so are all these other things. Information transfer, social closeness, social etiquette, and internal dialogue. So we need to be sure that we're working with our kids on having all of these, not just the wants and needs part. So part of um, how we're gonna approach language is the idea of the least dangerous assumption. 
So you know how doctors have their first do no harm? So in the field of special education and augmentative communication, I really think of the least dangerous assumption as our first do no harm. And that's that if, unless we have other evidence, we are going to make decisions that provide the least danger towards independent functioning later. So when I meet a new student or a new client, or when I'm talking to a parent, unless I have conclusive evidence to the contrary, I'm going to assume that that child is fully capable of communicating and we haven't taught them yet. I'm gonna assume that they're fully capable of learning to read and, read and write, but we haven't taught them yet. I'm gonna assume that whatever skills they aren't showing me aren't because they somehow are lacking the ability to learn them, but because we haven't taught them yet. And what I've found is changing the way we think about this makes it so people now say to me, oh, one of Kate's kids can communicate that way? Well, you know, the kids she chooses to work with, they, they have higher abilities. No, they don't. There's no special sign-up sheet that says, I'll only take the kids that have more ability. I take the kids who show up at my door, right? The kids who, who, whose parents call me and say, can you work my kid? And I say, well, if you can fit my schedule and you live within 45 minutes, okay. Um, but the changing the assumption changes the results. So one of the things that we really have to think about and have to insist on with our teachers and professionals who are working with our kids is that they don't make assumptions that our child can't. In NAAC, what we, what we see is what we expect to see. Right, so if somebody looks at your child and they assume that your child is never gonna be able to do anything different than they're doing now, that's probably the result they're gonna get. But if they look at your child and they see potential and possibility, then that's probably the result they're gonna get. They're gonna, they're gonna see outcomes. So I, I love this poster, perception drives expectation. Right, so what we perceive of the child is what we then expect from the child. Expect Expectation drives opportunity. What we expect from them changes what we allow them to try to do. Opportunity drives achievement. What we let them try is what they end up showing us they can do. And achievement drives perception, and then you're in this loop. I have one mom of a, a child who is very physically challenged. She's one of my kids who shut her eyes when she uh, doesn't want to deal with me, right? Um, her mom always sets up her eye gay speech device on her wheelchair and on her, her walker, um, no matter where they are, even if it's physically impossible for her to use that speech device. So eye gaze devices don't work well in the sun, but when they go to the county fair, they set up the eye gaze device on her wheelchair, even though it can't be used. And the reason they do it is it changes how people treat their daughter. When her speech device is set up in front of her, people talk to her, especially now that that show Speechless is on TV, right? Because they're like, oh, you're like that kid in Speechless. And then they just talk to her like a regular person, whereas if there's no device set up, they don't talk to her at all. So it changes that perception, and changing perceptions is a big part of what we have to do to make communication happen. So some of the things we have to check and we have to check in the people who work with our kids is we have to make sure that a historical belief of severe dis development of disability is not educational data. If you hear somebody say, well, all kids with this diagnosis do that, or I've never seen a child with such complex needs accomplish this, no, that they're making an assumption. They're basing your kid on every other kid and that's, that's not okay, they need to change what they're thinking. They need to um, think about any research that's been done, and if that research is based on people who have not had proper interventions. So for many years, research in Down syndrome told us that people with Down syndrome couldn't really accomplish anything. But the people they were looking at were people who had been institutionalized their whole lives and had never gone to school. So of course that's what the data told us. But once we changed the paradigm and made it so kids with Down syndrome were going to school and they were living in the community, then it turned out that, guess what, lots of people with Down syndrome were achieving great things. 
They were living on their own. They were having relationships. They were having jobs. And this is true in all the disability communities. And the newer disability communities and, and rare syndromes that are newly named and newly diagnosed kind of have a double-edged sword in that there's not a whole lot of historical data. You can't say, well, what were people with this disability doing 40 years ago if it wasn't named as a disorder 40 years ago or nobody knew how to diagnose it then. But at the same time, um, because it's, it's a new diagnosis, people sort of lump your kids in with all the kids with autism or all the kids with CP and make all these assumptions that are based on absolutely nothing. Um, we also can't just assume that um, what we're seeing from a child in front of us is the most potential they have because a lot of our kids who have developmental disabilities were educationally neglected. And I'm not saying they were, they were taught by bad people. I'm not saying that their therapists were terrible. I'm saying that what we knew 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago was wrong. And I was a teacher 20 years. I, I did it wrong. And I feel terrible about it, but I didn't know. None of us knew that we should be doing things differently. So you can't judge your three-year-old today on an adult who was raised in a completely different educational system. Everything has changed since then. All right, so one of the things we're gonna do is we're gonna think about how do we take these kids and give them a means to communicate? So the first thing is, they need a way to communicate. You can't communicate without a means. So a lot of your kids have some sign, you're gonna keep out the sign language. A lot of your kids have some verbal language, you're gonna keep out that verbal language. Augmented and alternative communication, the kind of communication I'm talking about, does not replace those things. We are multimodal, we want all of those things. And the question I heard from both parents or families that I consulted with today was, will giving my child AAC impact their verbal ability? And it's a good question. A lot of research has been done on that. I mean, a lot of research, because it's what everybody's afraid of. All of the research says that adding augmented communication to your child's other means of communication will either keep their verbal abilities exactly the same or will increase their verbal abilities. Not one study says that they'll decrease. So adding AAC will either keep things the same verbally or they'll increase their verbal ability, which is really cool how it happens. It happens all the time. If you ever go on like eBay and look for high-tech speech devices, you'll see a bunch of them for sale and they'll say, he only used it for three months and then he talked, right? It happens all the time. Not necessarily in this community, a lot in the autism community, because what happens is you've got that anxiety about talking. You give a child a device, the anxiety that they're not going to be able to make their message goes away, right? Because they know they can make their message. Less anxiety means less apraxia, means ver more verbal output. So there's a pretty decent chance that adding AAC will help um, with verbal output. It's not a promise, but it, it could help. So what we're going to look at when we're choosing an AAC system, first we're going to look at vision. Obviously, we want something that your child can see. Now, if your child doesn't have great vision or has cortical vision impairment, that doesn't mean that they can't have AAC. It just means it's a consideration. I have kids who are completely blind who use high-tech AAC. We just change how they access it a little. We're going to look at their hearing. I work with a child who is um, pretty much deaf who uses an AAC device. We sign to him. He answers with his device. Um, we're going to look at behavior as it relates to communication. Obviously, you don't want to give a child who throws things a very fragile device, right? You want the military-grade stuff when you've got a kid who's going to throw things. You also maybe want it in some padding so when it hits you in the head as it flies across the room, you don't get hurt. <coughs> I'm saying that as someone who's been hit in the head with a communication device more than once. Um, you want to look at motor skills. What are their fine, gross, and and what are their fine and gross motor skills and what is their positioning and mobility, right? If you have a kid who spends most of their time on the couch, you want a system that's going to work on the couch, right? Um, I'm just going to pause for a second and say, is there somebody keeping time for me? Somebody going to give me a signal at some point? Yeah? Okay. Just checking. Yeah, unless you guys want to stay all day. I guess what I'm 
You'll stay all day. I'll just keep talking. Somebody bar the doors. Um, we got plenty of time is what I'm hearing. All right. So we're going to look at and their mobility. If your kid is ambulatory, they're going to need a way to carry their device. Um, there are lots of great options for that. There are um, harnesses that are really cute that can be custom made for your kid. There's carry straps. There's all different options, but it's something you have to think about. Um, your access method, how will the child select the buttons? A lot of your kids are just going to be touching the touch screen, which is really easy. Some of your kids um, some of your kids may not be able to touch a touch screen, and then we're going to look at alternatives. Is a joystick better? Is a mouse better? Is eye gaze better? Um, so there are lots of other options if touching a touch screen isn't going to work. We're going to look at their sensory issues and sensitivities. I have more than one kid I've worked with who cannot stand the electronic voice. So they use a high-tech device, but they show you what they've typed or touched in pictures as opposed to having it speak because they hate the sound. Um, and do they need any other features? You know, if do you have a kid who really needs to be able to launch a timer for themselves to, or do you need to be able to launch a timer? for them to be able to regulate themselves. What are those needs like? So one of the things we think about is robust AAC. So back in the olden days, a long, long time ago, um, we used to give kids a choice of two. How many of you were told to give your kids a choice of two? Yeah, how many of your kids are older than 10? And you had a choice of two? Yeah. How many of you have young kids and are being told a choice of two? Oh, no. Okay. Uh, yeah, so... Oh, man, my work is not yet done. Okay, so a choice of two is great. Choices are important, um, but choices are not communication. Okay, choosing from, you know, do you want milk or do you want juice is, is you know, it's important. You don't want to give them something they don't want. But it's not communication. So it always has to be paired with a robust system of communication. And when I say robust, what I mean is a system that has motor planning supported by consistent vocabulary arrangement. Every major system on the market right now has this. So Proloco to Go has this. Lamp has this. Touch Chat with Word Power has this. All the major systems have this, so you don't have to worry about it. Those things I just named, those are communication apps. I'm not sure how, how far back I go. How many of you know what Proloco to Go is? So like half. All right. So these, um, Proloco to Go is an app you can buy on an iPad. It's about $300. It's very well researched and well supported. It has lots of great options for how you set it up. If you don't go messing with your settings too much, it has all of the things that make it a robust AAC system. Another choice is something called Touch Chat. The app Touch Chat comes with many different vocabularies. They're all terrible. <laughs> I hope there's nobody from Touch Chat in the room. Sorry. But with that being said, you can buy an add on called Word Power, and Word Power is excellent. So if you buy Touch Chat with Word Power, um, that's another great AAC option. Um, another system that's out there that just came on the market is something called The Grid. Um, it's from the largest communication system developer in England. So it's um, less popular in the States, but it's very popular um, in Europe. Um, all of those are AAC systems available on the iPad. There are also dedicated devices, which means that they're basically computers or tablets that have been modified to only do AAC. But those are all priced so high that if you're going to get one, you're going to go through insurance. Because um, all of them are priced in like $6,000 range. Um, and although the companies would deny it, they're priced there because that's how much Medicaid will pay. Right? Medicaid says, the top price we will pay for a dedicated device is $6,000. And all the companies say, isn't that a coincidence? Our device costs $6,000. Isn't that amazing? Um, so, motor planning is that the buttons stay in the same place. Everybody hold up your hand. Come on, you can do it. 
not that close to lunch, dial your first phone number. Your whatever the first number you remember having is. Where are my old people? All right, how many of you could do it? You could do it without it in front of you. So that means your motor muscle, right? Your muscle motor memory kicked in because you knew the pattern, right? I can do my, my original phone number. I can do it rotary or I can do a touchpad, right? Um, that's motor planning. So the idea in AAC is the word want is on the, in the same place every time it appears in the device. So your hand knows that the word want is right there. You're not going to be searching all over. It's always here. The word I is always there. So your hand memorizes it. So if you use a system that has good motor planning in it, your body can remember where something is without thinking about it. So I have a, a young lady I work with, a 16-year-old, um, and she is able to, her iPad is slower than she is. So she'll touch, she uses a system called POD, which is um, a system I really, really love. Um, but it's a low-tech book-based system, and then there's also an app. Um, and she uses the app right now, but she'll touch, I want, and then it takes a, you know, maybe a second for the iPad to get to the I want choices. She hovers her hand over where the food and drink button will be before it appears. Right? Because she's got that pattern down. She doesn't even really need to look. And there are times when I watch her and she will be doing this without the device in front of her. So like her hand is talking to herself. Usually when she's doing that, she's saying, something is wrong. I don't want to do this. Or my personal favorite, something is wrong. I don't feel safe. Too many people are here. And they're only us, the two of us. <laughs> Too many people are here. All right. I get the point. <laughs> hint, hint. Or she'll just wave at me. Be like, why are you waving? And she'll take her device and say goodbye. I'm not leaving. Nice try. Um, another feature of a robust, robust system is an expandable vocabulary. So it's a system that can grow with you. Um, and again, everything I've mentioned, all the major systems already have this. They know the definition of robust language as well as I do. So their systems already have this. So that means you can grow the system. And some systems, that means you can start at 20 buttons and go up to 108 or 118. And in some systems, that means you can have a bunch of buttons hidden and then add buttons as you need them. I'm hearing bounds. Um, Another feature is grammar. Now, we're not probably going to use grammar features at first, but at some point, we do need to be able to say was instead of is. So the ability to use grammar features needs to be there. The alphabet needs to be there because the only way to say whatever you want on a system is through spelling, right? There's like 100,000 words in the English language, and the most robust system only has 14,000 words. So if you can't spell, you can't say whatever you want. Um, if you're lucky, the system will also have a search feature, which means for you as a mom or dad, when you're trying to find the word Christmas in you know the beginning of December, you can do a search and it'll show you where Christmas is in the system. Um, Pre-programmed home messages for fast moving situations. There are times when you don't wanna hit every button um, when you're communicating because it'll take too long. So you do need some buttons that'll say a whole phrase. Um, the example I usually give is if you go to CVS, right? So let's say, you know, your child's a little bit older and you want to work with them that they're going to go in and pick up their own prescriptions at CVS. You want them to have just one button that says, I'm here to pick up a prescription. You don't want them to find every word on that because it did take too long. The people behind them in line would start to have a, a riot. It'd be, you know, it'd be a bad scene. So you, you want to have that set up for whole phrases. And the last thing is core language. Core vocabulary are the words that make up 80% of what we say. So if you think about the sentence I just said, 
core vocabulary. So core is not a core word, right? It's uncommon. Vocabulary is an uncommon word. Core vocabulary, are, is a very common word. That's a core word. The is very common. Words is, is in the list of common words, but it's a little further down the line. That, that, core word, make, core word, up, core word. 80% um, obviously not a core word. Of is a core word, what is a core word, we is a core word, say is a core word. So in that sentence, over 80% of the sentence was these core words. So most systems, and the little tiny picture up there um, that you can see is most, that's the front page of Touch Chat 60, maybe? Word power, touch Chat Word Power 60. And it has mostly core words. Now, our problem in AAC is for many years, we put our kids in noun town. We only gave them nouns. Hundreds and hundreds of nouns. No verbs. No pronouns, just nouns. Um, and so that doesn't work to communicate. If you're only allowed to um, say nouns, you really can't say anything. So most AAC systems have really moved over to, to core words. So let's say you pick a system. And here I want to say, I don't care what system you pick. I am I'm very agnostic about AAC system. I want you to pick something that meets all of these criteria and will work for you. If you go back, yes. Oh gosh, could that be deliberate? I don't know. Could I be deliberately not mentioning something? It's entirely possible. I'm just gonna drink water. <laughs> PEX is an, an excellent system in the following circumstance. If you have a child who does not show communication intent, if your child doesn't understand that telling you something or giving you something gets a result, if they don't understand that interaction, that's what PEX was invented for. If your child has that, if your child understands that if they bring you the remote, you'll turn on the TV, you don't need PEX. Okay, the PEX people won't tell you that. That's obviously they want you to do it their way. And if you have a, an excellent PEX practitioner and you want to stick with that, more power to you. What the research is telling us, though, is that when we give kids robust language and we, we do what I'm going to talk about in a, in a minute and we show them how to use it properly, they'll develop more language quickly. Pe but PEX has its place for those kids who don't have intent. And I don't, you know, I don't know of any better way to teach it than PEX. Also, a lot of times what we are calling PEX isn't PEX, right? PEX requires two adults with your one child. Does anybody in this room who's done PEX had that situation? No. So you weren't actually doing PEX. You were doing some version of PEX that somebody invented, but the actual PEX program requires a clinician, your child, and another adult to teach the program. And it's very, and it's an intensive and ongoing program that's very staff intensive. And schools will often say they're doing PECs. They're not, because they don't have the staff to do PECs, frankly. Um, but if you're gonna do PECs, I would pair it with a core language experience. So your child can have their, their noun symbols, with all the I wants and their I want, you know, sentence strip. But you can also have a core language board that you're using to model to them, right? So you can do both things. Um, but if it works solely up to me, if your kid has communication intent, I give them a robust system and do what I'm about to talk about now. I hope that was very tactful. I'm often, I'm often not, so I, I made a big effort. Um, all right, so core words. So the systems will have core words so that the kids can learn to combine words to say different things. I often think of core words as the recyclable words, right? They're words you can use in more than one situation. So volcano, not a core word, right? Oftentimes I'll go into classrooms and see teachers programming in all this language into kids' speech devices. And I'll be like, you're working way too hard. You know, you don't need all those random, they don't need, you know, Alexander Hamilton 
unless they're really into that and it's on the music page. They don't need it, Alexander Hamilton on their people page, right? Because how often are they going to say that? Um, so the core words are those words that you can use in more than one place. So now let's assume that you leave here, you go home, you somehow get your hands on a robust AAC system. Maybe you have an iPad and you put ProLoco to go on it. Maybe you work with school or a local hospital or AAC clinic and you get a dedicated device. What are you going to do at home? So this is sort of how I've simplified this for, for parents and for paraprofessionals and for people who just don't know what to do with this new big box of words that you got in the house. So what I brought it down to is the idea of motivate, model, move out of the way. So you want to motivate your child to use language. Um, you want to model, which is you use the language system that they're going to use. Um, and then you want to back off and let them play with it and learn how to find words and learn how to communicate with it. So let's talk about each of these things a little bit. So the idea of motivate. So you're going to use whatever motivating activities are exciting for your child. Now you don't only want to use AAC for the things that are motivating and exciting. But when you first start off, the easiest time to start using AAC is when you're doing things that are fun. All right. So I have one kiddo where her favorite thing in the world is bacon. So uh, the first thing we worked on was we talked about bacon, how much we like bacon. We wrote stories of bacon, about bacon. We, it was a lot about bacon. We did a lot of talking about, I like it, I want it, different sentences with it. And we started modeling her AAC system during meal times because that's when she was the most engaged. Um, this is a, a kiddo who really loved Dora the Explorer. So what we would do is we'd watch Dora the Explorer and I would talk about what was happening in the episode well, by using their device with the child. So if Dora was going to, Dora and Boots were going to go on an adventure, I would say they go with the device. So I would just take anything happening in the video and I'd add the language to it. Um, this, that's Graham. Graham is like 22 now and he's just a little boy there. Um, you can see he's using AAC on a horse, right? That's when he got into his communicating was when he was up on the horse. So we found a way to make that happen. That's the app Toka Boca Hair Salon. I don't know if you've heard of this AAC app, but um, it took, it's actually Toka Boca Hair Salon Me. Um, you put a picture of the child and then it's put behind a cartoon and then you can cut the hair and blow dry the hair and lots of great language there that you can use. Um, this is a picture of a child's screen. She was trying eye gaze for the first time. And what she thought was hilarious was gravity. So our first session, I literally just dropped a piece of paper on the floor about 10, 15 times. Every time she told me to drop, I would drop it. Um, if she told me not, I would crumple it up and throw it away. Um, just a, That was just our first interaction to get her to understand that when she said something, that it translated into me doing something. That's from the app um, Don't Let the Pigeon Ride the Bus. That whole series of books, the whole Milo, Mil, uh, Mo Willems series of books, um, Don't Let the Pigeon, whatever. And the Elephant and Piggy books, they're really good for core language, so you can model language as you read a story. Um, that's a young lady watching some YouTube videos of science experiments because for some reason that's what she liked. I had a kid who was very into Blue's Clues, a kid who was very into washing machines. Seriously, you, you do what you have to do, man. We went to the laundromat, we had our AAC sessions in the laundromat. <laughs> Kill two birds with one stone, man. My laundry was done. <laughs> exactly. I was like, I do the wash on Sunday afternoon. Can you meet me there? <laughs> um, uh, this is a young lady who's um, dying Easter eggs, but we had loaded the eggs, which were hard-boiled eggs, into an automated pouring cup, where if you press the button, the cup would dump the egg out. And um, yeah, it was really exciting. Um, but the pouring cup um, gave us a lot to talk about, because, you know, there was mess. Um, and I, I don't know if you can see this in the slide up there, but 
Shannon is holding something in her hand. It's a hundred dollar bill because we do what it takes. Right? We use motivating activities. So this is a video which hopefully is going to play. But not with sound. All right, well, I'll, I'll just tell you what's happening. So that little boy is Bodie. He is, I think, four. In that picture, he's now eight. Um, and you can see me touching his iPad, and I, and I pressed, um, I think I pressed roll the ball, and then I pressed my turn, and then I'm going to roll the ball into the box, and I missed. And then I think I said, oh, no, and then I tried again, and I missed. And then I think I said, oh, no, again. And then he's trying it. And we rolled it into the box. And, oh, we're going to do it again. And now I'm modeling my turn. And he gave the ball back to me. And then I said, I'm going to roll the ball. And I roll the ball back in. I hope. I think I do. There we go. Um, and the whole time, you can see, I never ask him to say anything with this talker. Right? I'm never making him say something to make it happen. We're just playing, and I'm putting language onto everything we do. So if he rolls it in, I, I hit his talker, and I say, roll it in. And if he doesn't um, roll it in, then I say, oh no, you missed. So that's the idea of using um, motivating activities in order to um, stimulate conversation. This young lady is very into food, so we used a motivating activity. She was saying like and not like about pictures of food I showed her, and everything she liked we put on the page. The next piece is modeling. The idea is language immersion. Right? If we use their talker, they'll use their talker. If we speak to them with their talker, they'll better understand because they'll visually see the, the symbols of what you're saying, and they'll learn how to use their talker. So from the moment a baby is born, they hear and respond to the spoken word. They hear language for the first 18 months of their lives before they say anything back. Right? So what I usually do at this point is I ask, who knows a baby? And then I say, when do you stop talking to the baby? Right? You brought it home, you talked to it for a week, it hasn't said anything back. I don't think we should talk to it anymore. You know what? It's been three months. That's a quarter at school. They've made no progress on their goal of learning to verbally communicate. No more talking to the baby. We're only going to say more and all done. That's it. No other words. Right? And, of course, my point is, for typical kids, we give them language input. We model language for them for 18 months before we ask them to do anything. But we don't give our kids with disabilities that same right. So I want us to think about that. What if we got a robust system we modeled intensively for 18 months before we even tried to have the child use it? First of all, none of your kids would let you wait 18 months before they could touch it telling you that right now but <laughs> but imagine the language input they would get if we did it the same way that typical kids do so basically we're going to take this communication strategy of modeling which if you want to be fancy we call aided language stimulation or aided language input or partner augmented input it has like nine names um, and we are going to model as much as possible right for Typical kids, we put spoken language in their, into their ears, and then they give us spoken language back. For our kids, we put spoken language in, and sometimes we want aided language back. We want communication with the system back, and it doesn't work that way. But if we put aided language in, we'll hopefully get some aided language out. All right? By 18 months, babies have heard 4,380 hours of spoken language. Right? If AAC users only get two times 30 a week of speech using their system, it's going to take 84 years 
for them to get the same exposure to AAC as a spoken child, get a child who's going to speak, gets to language in 18 months. Right? So we've got to sort of equalize the playing field a little bit more. We need to be modeling language for our kids who are going to be using aided language. So this is a best practice. There's research going back to 1988. Um, you know, it's something that, that we know. We can't pretend it's new. I'm going to actually skip a bunch of these. All right, and then the last thing is to move out of the way. So I know I, I talked about modeling. That's the biggest thing I want you to take away today. But the first thing I want you to take is all kids should have words, and the second thing is you should be using those words to talk to those kids. Finally, the idea of move out of the way. So this is the idea that we need to give our kids wait time, right? A lot of times kids with apraxia need a lot of time before they can give back what they want to give back. So you need to give them some space to be able to wait. Sometimes you need to physically get out of their face, especially for kids who are a little bit older. Right? There's always somebody in our kids' faces. And sometimes you just need to give them a little space to be able to figure out how to say what they want to say. Um, this is a version of the prompt hierarchy. On the left is the one that most ABA people use. On the right is the one that I've remade to talk about um, for kids with apraxia who are learning language. If you Google my name and prompt hierarchy, you'll find the, the image with the umbrella, and then you'll have it to you know, bring to school or whatever. Um, and that's how I find it when I want the image too, so <laughs> I'm not keeping anything from you. I didn't make it, somebody else did. All right, and then finally, oh, and that's it. So um, the last thing I want to say is I do run a social media group on Facebook called AAC through, motivate, model, move out of the way. It has uh, 6,400 members and change as of this morning. Um, I put the person who, who uh, lets people in on alert that I was going to mention it. So uh, if you would like to ask to be in the group, you are welcome to. It's a group of parents, professionals, and AAC users talking about AAC for kids who have apraxia and anxiety and other developmental issues who are using augmented communication. And um, with that, I'm going to go to questions. I, is there? I was just saying if you could repeat that again. What was oh, that? The name of the Facebook group again? That was your Facebook. How do you find me? Uh, Facebook is how to find me. Um, and it's a it's AAC through AAC and they'll post it on the app and uh, I had actually added the, a slide to the slideshow that had this but I guess I added it after I hit send so. hi I had a just a quick question um, my son is using I say using but after seeing this he's not using <laughs> the AAC uh, like we'd like him to. Once in a while, maybe more than that, he will start to kind of push random buttons. And I get it, that's nonverbal for bugger off. How do you suggest dealing with that? I don't want to promote it, but I also don't want to go, damn it, you're going to use this. <laughs> so so the first thing I do is start, start modeling more. You use it to talk to him more. Um, and almost always once they sense the attitude change that this is about talking to each other there'll be a shift in the child but if he's randomly hitting buttons you have two choices you can say I see that you're hitting buttons right now I think that you're just playing get my attention when you're ready to tell me something and I'm positive he knows how to get your attention right no I, I take any whatever way he normally does and then once he has your attention if he says something try to acknowledge it. So if he presses, you know, truck, 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 you can say, oh, you're thinking about trucks. You could tell me more about trucks. Or you could take the device and say, oh, trucks, I like trucks. And then give it back and see what he says. If he says bus, 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 say, oh, take it. I like buses too. And turn it into something. Because he's got to start to understand that this isn't a see and say. Right? And we accidentally teach kids that it's a C and say. 
So start to take what he says and make it into a conversation as best you can. Sound good? Yes. Hi. For those of us that don't live within 45 minutes, to you, <laughs> how do we go about finding someone that can teach our kids these skills? So um, it's, it's tough to find somebody who's sort of in the AAC revolution, as we like to say. When I posted that I was coming here, I was like, going to bring the AAC revolution to the Fila McDermott syndrome folks. Um, in the group I mentioned, you can post and say, does anybody know of a good cl clinician in my area? And say where you live, and everybody in the group will try to problem solve that for you. They are really big on problem solving. Not my favorite. I never ask anything because I don't like problem solving. But post that, and then just start asking around a little bit. Um, where do you live? In Texas. Um, yeah, I don't know anybody off the top of my head, but ask in the group, and the, there, somebody will probably come up with something. You're welcome. Hi, my uh, my son has a, a Nova Chat device that he never touches, and an iPad that he navigates like a wizard. Yeah. Um, my question is, would we be better off getting some sort of assistive communication on that iPad that he uses like a wizard, or should we continue trying to have two distinct devices for him? Um, so you're using NovaChat with, with word power, or do you know what vocabulary you have on the NovaChat? I believe word power. Okay. So NovaChat, uh, you can share vocabularies from the NovaChat device to the TouchChat app. They're the same company. So what I would do is I would get touch chat, if, if you can afford it, I'd get touch chat. I'd um, look up online how to transfer his vocabulary files over to his iPad and I'd have it in both places. And then I would have the two of you start modeling with the Nova chat and then offer it to him if he wants to say something, but remind him he can use his iPad to say things too. Um, but I'd keep the dedicated one and model, 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 model. Hi, my daughter is uh, six years old, almost six years old, and she uses a ProLoco to go. Mm -hmm. um, she actually does pretty well with it at school. Um, we obviously now need to start using it more at home. She does mostly signs and um, some vocal things at home. Um, our biggest question is we have a four-year-old daughter and my four-year-old niece who love the iPad. And they want to use it too. And we've been told, well, maybe you should, you know, keep that only for Amelia so that they don't think it's a game. But after this, I'm wondering if their modeling would also be beneficial for her or if that's something that we should only let Amelia use. So I always bring that question back to sort of consent. They should ask Amelia, can I use your talker? Can I use your iPad to, to use your talker? And if Amelia's fine with that, they should model, model, model for her too. The other thing I'd really suggest is if you have siblings and friends that model and like the devices, make videos of them saying things with the devices. Your kids love videos. Your kids love people. You make videos of their favorite people using AAC, you're gonna get big returns. So I'd let them use it if it's okay with Amelia. I missed the very beginning where you said you were from uh, Massachusetts. Thank you. <laughs> She's like, 45 minutes from. <laughs> yes. Hi. Um. So my son just turned three, and I'm wondering, he, we were basically told that he doesn't even have enough comprehension to use a device yet, because he doesn't under like, we're still working on him identifying f physical objects or pictures, not even a drawing, like, you know, that represents a category or something. So, you know, like, I mean, there'll be a picture of me and a picture of, like, you know, any inanimate object and sometimes you know if you say where's mom he'll get it all the time and sometimes he doesn't so but but i mean at th what i seem to be hearing hearing now though is that it's like maybe the earlier the better so i was just wondering what your thoughts are so that's some very old thinking this you have to do pictures before you can do line drawings or you have to do objects before you do that's very old thinking the research doesn't bear out the way we used to do that so the person you're working with is sort of using research from the 80s um, which, again, it's what we did. We, if you don't know better, you can't do better. Um, but I, and, and I think he probably knows who, who, who mommy is, right? Like, at some point, where is mommy? The answer is, I'm not telling you again, you're stupid. 
right? I mean, even if you're three, that's the answer. So my, I would go with a more robust system and start modeling. A lot of three-year-olds, I, I just the AV, if you could, thank you, just because I'm trying to look at the person I'm answering. Um, a lot of three-year-olds aren't going to use a device when you first, a lot of kids in general, but especially the younger kids. When you start modeling, no, tomorrow they're not going to say, I love you, mom, but they will. It just, you know, like I said, it, it takes a long time of language input. So I would start now. I'd get a robust system and start modeling. The little boy you saw rolling the ball, right? His name is Bodhi, his Angelman syndrome, very apraxia, anxiety, all stuff similar to this. His parents started modeling robust language when he was two. He came on my caseload when he was three. Between the ages of three and six, I saw very little from him using the talker but we modeled constantly. When I saw him Thursday before I left to come, we left Massachusetts to come here, I walked into his house, he told me hello, he said, I want blocks. We got out the blocks, he told me he wanted a tower. I mean, all of this with the talker, a tower, I built the tower, he knocked it down, I touched, knock it down, he touched, knock it down, he laughed. He went to his music page, he told me he wanted to listen to Bruno Mars. I mean, but he's eight now. But when he was three and four and five, it was just us talking to him. And, and that's kind of how it works sometimes. So I, I'd start now, and, and if school wants to make him find pictures of mommy, you can't stop them. But I'd, <laughs> I'd start with robust language. Hi, my name is Maria, and I'm from Texas. Uh, my daughter is 24, and she used that touch of when she mm -hmm. was in high school, mm -hmm. four or five years ago. And, but we haven't used it. So should we, and she has a uh, speech therapy going on. So should we go back to that and start using and modeling that you said or try something different? Do you feel like she has things she wants to say that she isn't able to say? Exactly. If, if I mean, she brings the remote, she uh, brings the iPad or she brings, she takes mm -hmm. us to the refrigerator. Yep. So yeah, I'd go back to it and I'd start modeling. And, um, you know, change everything that was programmed in there? No, well, you can probably, I mean, it depends on how it was programmed. If it meets the criteria I showed you with consistent language placement and core words and all of that, if it meets that, leave it and just go back to it. And if it doesn't, because it's touch chat, you can just switch to a new copy of, of And she has it in her favorite iPad, which she's using for movies and music and all that. Oh, well, you so might we need, need it on it. a separate iPad. Okay. You might need one for talking and one for playing. Otherwise, it'll just be for playing. Um, how do you feel about ProLoCortico? Is it a good program? Yes. I, like I said, I'm, I'm system agnostic. I have a list of apps that you know I mentally keep in my head that meet my criteria, and ProLoCortico meets my criteria as long as you don't go start with a blank vocab and make your own. Then, then it's it's no longer ProLoCortico. But ProLoCortico is a good app. Spell ProLoCortico? Sure. It's Pro. P R O Lo L O so P R O L O Quo Q U O the number two Go G O Real quick, um, child care ends at noon and it's noon. So if you have to get up and go. I'll answer Good questions morning. until they kick me off the stage. So if you still have I, questions. I have, a, a, I have all the problems that we have with uh, the school that you've been talking about. <laughs> um, they're telling us about PECs. They're saying my son can't use an AAC device because he throws them. Obviously, he wants to communicate or he wouldn't be throwing them. Um, <laughs> and, and they're telling us that he can't. He can't learn, he can't do this, he can't do that. How do you deal with these people? How do you make them, how do you, how do you twist their necks without actually going to jail? Oh, do you know how much money I would have if, have if I knew the answer to that? I, I don't have a good answer for that. The, I, I, I can't, like, difficult people are difficult people and there's not much you can do about them. I think, you can show there are tons of resources out there. Um, join join the group I mentioned and ask ask say what have you brought to your team to get them to change their thinking and people will share. Um, 
I think the big thing is you need to not, if they're, you know, they only have your kids six hours a day and you have the rest of the time. So if you have to, think of school as your respite so that you can do the real work at home. And I know that sounds terrible, but if you're in that situation, get him a device at home, get him a harness that he, where he wears it, you can't throw a device that's attached to your body. Um, start modeling at home, start doing all this at home, and then you take video and you show them. You tell me he can't, here he is, here he is doing it. Yeah. But the problem is evaluations were not designed for our kids. So that they, they will easily be able to produce a valuation that says he can't. I think the only thing you can do is try to do it at home and then provide them with proof that he can. So, I mean, so our son is nine and he has a four okay, button. Whoever, there you are. Oh, Sorry. right here. <laughs> um, he's nine and he has a four button speech device that they put pet cards in. and occupational therapy speech therapy and at school they all use it the same but it's all like carter show us the pig carter is this red or is this blue and like sometimes he'll be a hundred percent and like his eqt at the end of the year was the letters of the alphabet and he got like 20 out of 26 right but then sometimes he doesn't even want to touch it because i think he like you said he probably thinks we're stupid because we keep saying <laughs> carter where's the purple mickey mouse head um but anytime I bring up a different device, they just, we pretty much get shut down with, oh, well, if he can't, if he's not using this device to 100% accuracy and he can't show us the purple Mickey Mouse head every time we ask him, there's no way he can move on to a, a different device. If you can afford it, I would get him an iPad and do it yourself and go the same route I just said. Mm -hmm. Set him up with, pick an app. Set up, I mean, if you, if, you have, if you can afford it, it's a different story yeah. if you can't, but if you can, I would set him up with that start using it at home, start modeling, take some video and show he can. It's really hard to get these people to change their way of thinking. Um, but you could also show them Project Core. There's a website called Project Core that at least could help them move from find the cow to using core language. So the Project Core website might be helpful. C-O-R-E, Core, Project Core. All right. I Hi, yeah. um, my daughter is 14, and over the years we've tried many, many, many things, and she's been successful for times and then regressed, and um, she's had a lot of regression since hitting puberty as far as communication, um, but recently I've noticed she's doing a lot of eye gaze. Now, she is completely mobile. She can touch, but like the gentleman over here said, she throws everything. And she, um, but she has been successful with like looking at the drink or looking at yeah. you know specifically. Would you suggest going more toward the eye gaze? Or I'd give it a try. Making her touch. No, I give it. I give it a try. Okay. There's um, again, if you every state in the country has an assistive technology lending library. The AT Lending Library may or may not have an eye gaze device to borrow that you could try. The other thing is the um, all of the speech companies will come to your house and do a demo. So you can call Toby, you can call PRC, you can call all of these companies that make devices, and their local rep will come to your house and do a demo for free where your kid can at least try it and you can see if it's a possibility. No, but again, if go to the group that I mentioned and mention it and people will, that group is so eager to help people. Like if you're like, tell me what companies call for an eye gaze trial, you'll get 4,000 responses. Hi, my daughter uses um, Unity on PRC. Yeah. Uh, her device is kind of large, she can't carry it. So we found recently from AAC in the cloud, uh, the app Cough Drop, yep. and I made her I tried my darndest to make her board in there, which is about impossible. But she doesn't have a key guard on it. I feel like she then is, again, she waits for it to come up because she's like, I just want to eat. Um, yeah. Is that good for her? Because we can take that with us. I don't really, I mean, $6,000 versus an iPad getting messed up is a little easier for yeah. me. Um, is there, what are your um, thoughts it, on that, I guess? What vocabulary is she using on PRC? Unity. Unity. How many buttons? Um, 
I want to say uh, 64. Is so that have you looked at LAMP? We do look at LAMP. I think she's kind of a combination of both. I kind of was kind of thrown to this on my own doing, and I'm not, I'm pretty good at it, <laughs> at figuring out. So, so I just, I mean, I like cough drop, and they have a good core vocabulary option, but if your daughter knows Unity, I would try to stick with something Unity-based. I'd look at the LAMP app. Okay. And then there's a company that makes key guards, I believe, that is simply called AT Key Guards. Okay. Um, that where you can order a lamp key guard for an iPad. The app doesn't go down to her key level. That's my problem with the Yeah, lamp. so just hide the extra buttons. Oh, okay. Duh. Okay. <laughs> and then one other thing. I'm sorry. Yeah. The core, she can say, I want more, I don't like, and it's only with show and eat. Do yeah. I give her the option of adding more fringe? Like the pages button, I hide completely because God knows where she's going to go, but do I leave that open? I would leave it Tomorrow. open when she's just hanging out. Okay. But when she needs to be having a conversation about something, if it's distracting, hide it again. Okay. And I hide eat. Is that bad too? Because she'll only she obsessed eat. with it. Yes. Um, as long as she has another way to tell you if she actually seriously needs to eat, then I it's want fine. more. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I heard another parent with a kid with Phelan McDermott syndrome recommend lamp words for life and yep. apparently they do a training yep is that in line with your principles yep. okay. lamps on my list okay so lamp is a different vocabulary arrangement so proloquo to go uh touch chat with word power those are arranged categorically um so if you're looking for a thing you go in the thing folder lamp and unity which is what her daughter's using are arranged in what's called semantic compactation or word association so if you hit the apple, it has all words related to apple. So it has grow and eat and then a bunch of food words. But it, so it's difficult, you have to sort of memorize the patterns. So it's harder at first, but the long-term output, people who use LAMP or Unity are faster and more fluent many years down the road. But it is harder at first. Are there trainings for Proloquo to go? Um, How to Proloquo to Go has a bunch of, their website is enormous and they have tons of trainings for free on their website. Mm -hmm. And they used to have certified trainers around the country, but I think they got rid of that program. But okay. I was a certified trainer, so I know it used to exist. Okay. Um, but any app, all the good apps you can find in online community too that will support you. Okay, so my question is, if your child doesn't have the ability to isolate the pointer uh -huh. finger because of motor skills, yep. then, which she may have in the future, but right now, it's yeah. just not there, so... Is she doing a raking? Yeah, she okay. does, like, pulling, or she could do, like, a full hand yeah. touch. That's why How old is she? She's just five. Um, so, I mean, I haven't met her, so I can't make very specific recommendations, but... There are lots of different access. You can try eye gaze, you can try a joystick. Um, so if you have an AAC clinic near you where you can get an eval, I'd I brought that. her to the specialists in Vancouver and they kind of just said, oh. I felt like they just shut her down, like, well, she can't do this. Have you tried, can she isolate her finger to do like YouTube? To go to YouTube? Yeah. No, she's never even watched <laughs> oh, okay. TV. Is there anything where she can I isolate her finger for at all? Um, I mean, she's she has done like a Cheerio for eating all right. a few times. So what I would do is pick an app where you can get bigger buttons. Um, so like Proloquo to go or Touch Chat, you can have different sizes. Mm -hmm. okay. I would get a key guard if you can. So a key guard. A key guard is a plastic overlay. Okay. That goes over the touch screen that makes it so you have to put your finger in the hole to press the button. Okay. Um, and then I would model like crazy, because even if she's not giving you anything out yet, yeah. at least she's learning the language system for when her body's ready. Okay. Um, and then if you can, I mean, like I said, even in Canada, you can call and have them come do a demo of eye gaze and stuff in the house for you to try. Okay. But if she's still raking at five, my, my guess is she'll probably get the finger isolation. Mm -hmm. um, and I do as many activities as you can where she's working on that. So, like, take a Tupperware container and cut some holes in the top and have her push pom-poms in. Okay. Or um, anything you can do that gets her working on that using okay. her finger. 
Um, but I would definitely get a language system and start modeling it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I don't know who is. You know uh, so I have a six-year-old, and I'm trying to convince the school that we probably need one of these. And am I better off with the private speech that we're going to start doing? Will I have more luck? <laughs> she seems to be more into functional language versus the school's academic yeah. model. Um, I mean, it all depends on the person, right? So for at school and at private speech, it depends on the person. Um, so I don't know if you have better luck or not. Well, the school is big on PECs. I tried PECs for like five university sessions and pulled my hair out and said, what the hell am I doing? I mean, again, I, I keep going back to the same advice, but I would do it yourself. Yeah, I'm just thinking that <laughs> if I to convince her, I found that there was somebody with a dedicated yeah. device yeah. that has the I want, which yeah. he needs. He can tell me he wants stuff. Yeah. He, he goes to the truck, but he wants to go for a ride. And he opens the fridge. Yeah. He shows you, go to your room, because that's what you do at night when I'm up with Dad. So he's there. But I'm like, yeah. this so test that he gave me is yeah. in the ready. 80s now. So thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Uh, when we got one for Logan, we had gone to a, a speech pathologist or a, a therapist that I think it might have been our neurologist actually uh, found a university lo that was, you know, we drove an hour to get to it, but they had people that could do an assessment with him, just, and they have like every device ever made available, and they run him through different trials and see what he did, you know, and of course he was running all, he just was in heaven uh, playing with all these you know, iPad-like devices, and once they said, yeah, he can do this, and you know there are some hurdles with the insurance co they work with the insurance companies and one of the things that i don't know if you know what the word dedicated means but it means it's just for communication even though it does it can be hooked to the internet they the insurance companies don't want to pay for it if it's something they can you know if it's just going to be a computer that can be played with they want it for communication and uh but once they agreed to pay for it um he got it and the schools are being trained you know this it's taken a few years, but they've learned the, the value of it. As a matter of fact, the one we're using right now is one on loan from the school because his is in for repairs. But uh, they actually, once he's shown he could use it academically and for communication, we were kind of concerned because, yeah, it's like $7,000 or something, and we're worried about it getting broken and you know, get some extra insurance. We asked them, are you, do you have insurance for this? You know, because when he's at school and and you're not protecting it or making sure it doesn't get stolen. And they actually, we went to the right to the, the um, or they, we found it easier rather than talking to like the local speech there, but we went right to the, the head of special education in our county. And they're like, oh yeah, well if he uses it, they went out and, and uh, bought one. They bought one, they've got their, their, every year it's in his IEP that the people working with him will be trained on it, how to use it with him. And, uh, there's still some hurdles, but it, it's been it's been very valuable. And actually, once you do get it, you can have it. Uh, you can have it, so it's not just dedicated. You can use it for other things. But it is better that he does just use it for communication because once he learns, he can you know do it YouTube or something out. Yeah, that's what he wants to do. But so he's got an iPad for that. But uh, that was the biggest trick for us is having him assessed at a you know like a university or something. Have your neurologist or somebody get him to you know have a script or whatever they got to do uh, uh to have him sent to a specialist that can have him assessed did they give you like a, my school fights with they will not give her a device we bring our device with her every day at school so that's why we did cough drop because then i can track them they can provide her an ipad did they give you like a code or a law that says that they have to provide it for her or him i'm sorry well i think every state's different in how much is uh, they're allowed, but um, I was pretty surprised. And, and sometimes you might need an advocate from your area that knows the laws. And 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 uh, because if they do the paperwork, that was we got a great superintendent for special needs. Now they learned that she knows that if if they do their documentation showing that he has all these deficits, then they get more state money. The more state money they get, then then they can offer more services. You know. And, right. It's right. true. You should get a mailing or they should hand you, um, when you have an IEP, you should get 
all your uh, a booklet or a list of you know everything they're required to do um, legally, and that that sometimes will help. Sort of modeling or anything like that. What their response was is they came up with a whole different system, and now there's core boards all over the room. And my daughter's the only one in the classroom with an AAC, and none of those core boards are hers. So she's like, you know, in a room of a completely different language. Um, so I'm, I just need to go again. I need to go up the ladder, is what I think I need to do. And I would bring an advocate with you. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. You can get like an advocate with you at an IEP that might know all those ins and outs. Um, I always recommend to folks to go into the ARC, if there's an ARC chapter in, in your area. It used to be the Association for Retarded Citizens, I think. Now it's just the ARC. And I think they would have some legal advice, if not help, for those kind of things as well. And maybe they're the advocate that comes with you to an IEP, ARC. There's a waiting list. Okay. Talker. <laughs> I will I will say that one of the things that I do do sometimes but not that often is if there are wherever you live if your community has a cohort of kids who need AAC intervention I do sometimes do AAC road trips yeah uh, so with uh, PMS in, the, in like a five ten mile radius yeah, and where if we you are. hook if you were to also talk to like the rec community and the Angelman syndrome community there might be 10 or 15 so one of the things that that I have done for places where there's a real paucity of therapists is that I'll set up a road trip so you know I, I have somebody who coordinates those I have my my road tour manager I'm not very good with the organizational skills so my uh, my, my road trip organizer puts together a trip. So like in this past year, I, I did a drive from Boston to Birmingham, Alabama, and saw kids all the way down and all the way back. And then I did a drive from Boston to Toronto to Chicago to Cedar Rapids to St. Louis. So, so our question is, do you need groupies? Do I need groupies? <laughs> I do need groupies, but I can barely, like, I don't charge enough to feed myself, so. <laughs> But it, it, contact me on Facebook, and if you're interested in setting up something like that, we can we can discuss it. If you can't find somebody local, it's better if you have somebody local, obviously. Do you ever do um, like classes for special ed teachers? Yeah, all the time. Maybe I need to get my school district to bring you in. I I, I do do that. I'm not a, a it's not my favorite, <laughs> but I do do it. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, I think there are any people more questions. Like all right. Let's wonderful let's wrap program. it up. All right. Thank you all. And if you might get you might get lucky, I would go ahead and check that one-on-one -on -one schedule just in case someone backs out or in case uh, spot opens up. <laughs>